Elizabeth McAllister's article, which we are reading for today, pushes us in some different directions. On the one hand, like Bishop, it is going to spend a good deal of time discussing some of the social context around zombieism or the concept of the zombie in Haiti. And you'll get four or five different points of view that we didn't have in Bishop's article. So these two pieces go together really well, I think, to try to convey to us um, what, the, what the zombie was in the context of the Haitian culture or cultures that gave rise to it initially, and also how it is that Americans kind of first encountered um, th these concepts through their exposure to voodoo, largely with the kind of marine um, takeover of Haiti, uh, for lack of a better word, their occupation of Haiti uh, for, for a number of years, and how that concept was transported back to the United States. And it's a good article for a couple of reasons. One of them is that unlike um, Bishop's article, uh, McAllister has a really contemporary perspective. So Bishop's really focusing on white zombie and the film's kind of around white zombie. And McAllister is focusing more broadly on a number of films. Many of them are contemporary, many of them stretching up into just, you know, recent, recent times that we will have, I think, a better conceptual framework for once we get a little bit further in this, in this course. But right now there are some kind of fundamental comments that will come up against in this article that are important to keep in mind. One of the claims that McAllister is going to make along the way before you get to the end of this article is this idea that essentially in the 1940s and in the 1950s it became increasingly popular uh, for uh, movies to call any number of creatures zombie, okay? And what she's going to be arguing is that the zombie that we see in some of those films won't necessarily be the same zombie that we saw or the same kinds of zombies that we saw kind of repeatedly in the films from the very early uh, earliest periods that we watched in the first six or seven units of this course. It's an interesting argument and it's certainly borne out by what we're going to see in Scared Stiff. Uh, in Scared Stiff you will encounter a zombie that will have some of the basic characteristics that we've come to expect from the zombie, um, seeming mindlessness, um, you know, seeming kind of physical prowess, um, under control from some or from some other entity, and not really uh, under the direction of its own power. And that indeed is why it is to be so feared in the film, as we have a character very explicitly state as we go along. But there are some changes as well. The, the zombie obviously can think on its feet, uh, no pun intended. You'll see it proposing actions of its own. You'll see it uh, trying to be sneaky. You'll see it acting in some you know, pretty un-zombie way. So one of the things McAllister's trying to say in this article is that you know during the 40s and 50s we see a changing zombie. Now that really shouldn't be surprising to us at all, particularly after reading um, Kettleman's article yesterday or for the previous module and thinking a little bit about that, you might remember that one of the points I made there was that we were going from a period where the ghost shows were declining, um, uh, scary movies, gothic stories, horror stories, we're moving like many other forms of entertainment out of movie houses and into the home through broadcast television. There's still obviously a very robust, you know, motion picture industry in the 40s and 50s, but there's just more and more opportunity for the kinds of stories that might have played um, in some of the fringe um, markets um, or the the less uh, substantial markets to move on tele on television onto the smaller screen to make more money. And that's exactly what we see in Scared Stiff, and it's a good explanation for why this film looks so different, I would say, from anything else we've watched this semester. So let's start with some real basics, okay? At the end of Cattleman's article, she says that one of the things that the motion pictures companies tried to do, including Paramount, who puts out this film, um, was try to up their game in terms of their production value. So she was talking about CinemaScope and uh, other forms of kind of film technology that would allow movie houses to project images that people couldn't get in the comfort of their own homes. We see this in contemporary times, or at least we did for a few years anyway, at the turn of the millennium with 3D movies, which are still fairly uh, popular in theaters, but not really in homes. So it seems to be a technology that theaters are kind of capitalizing on at the moment. But we also see a bunch of other things going on in this film. 
Um, this is the first musical that we've watched. We have these large-scale, well-produced musical numbers um, that appear throughout the film. And, and the question is, why do those things keep showing up? Well, I think this is the influence of television. Certainly, it's the influence of um, you know the traditions that are making uh, Martin and Lewis, uh, the comedy team of Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, popular uh, at the beginning of the 1950s. They have a nightclub act, or they have nightclub acts that they go around and perform at different parts in the country, kind of like the ghost shows would have been performed around the country um, uh, a decade earlier and they're essentially known for that so they're bringing to this medium you know this in this film we have heightened production values we have something like the variety show format where we'll have a song and then you'll have a little bit of the adventure and then you'll go back to another song and then there'll be a little bit more of the adventure. But one of the things to keep in mind as you're moving through this film, which for long periods will feel nothing like any of the other zombie movies we watched this semester, is that the zombie story kind of comes into play. And when it does come into play in really the third act, it has all of the features or many of the features that we've come to expect from these kinds of stories. So just to kind of quickly catalog some of those here we once again have a criminal situation uh, in terms of the individual who's trying to get the castle uh, that Mary owns um, and gangsters or, or gangster mentality certainly is involved in the situation. We again have kind of a gothic mansion uh, where the zombie appears. We have references to other gothic tropes, uh, ghosts and spooks and uh, murder and all of these things coming up again and again and again. But there are some fundamental differences, and the fundamental differences being, of course, the zombie himself, uh, who comes across as something like a mix between the Frankenstein monster and perhaps just a simple murderer or a serial killer. Uh, his zombie attitudes um, are inconsistent. There are times when he seems perfectly aware. You'll notice one exchange where he's fighting with uh, Lewis and Martin in a suit of armor he's apparently dressed himself in, uh, and when they're brawling, he is as agile and thoughtful as either of the men that he's attacking. Um, so that's interesting. And I think in terms of McAllister's argument, I think it, it is somewhat fair to say it's a, it's a trash monster, but I think trash monster here we might use in a fairly loving way. Uh, the, the concept of the zombie is simply not as significant um, to the story, or at least it's not as important that the zombie be as well-defined as it was in previous films. And we might notice that some things are happening at this point. We have this changing relationship with race and the zombie. Uh, the zombie is not again predicted at, uh, uh, presented as an African individual, uh, which is a, uh, a noticeable change. We've seen it before, uh, but certainly most of the menacing men that we've seen in zombies in this class have been portrayed as you know individuals of African descent, whether they're Haitian or you know from some other minority group. So I think that's significant. Um, the zombie is also, I think, just simply part of this larger kind of, you know, gothic moment within the story. And so we should probably understand that the role of the monster here is diminished. Uh, it's not as significant as it was in previous times. And this is going to be really important um, for the next couple of films and then getting up to everything before Night of the Living Dead in this course. One of the things the director of Night of the Living Dead has said pretty famously, is that interest in zombies seems to come in cycles, or at least it comes in cycles during the 20th century. And when we get into these films, or films you know, in the 1950s, near the 1950s, it's quite frankly the case that there is diminished interest in the zombie. Okay, so we don't find as many uh, zombie films necessarily, or we don't find as many zombie films where the zombies seem to have the same kind of grounding that they did in films coming out of the 1930s and into the 1940s. Uh, the storytellers seem to be a lot less interested in kind of those fundamental roots of the creature, and it becomes enough simply to indicate or gesture toward the zombie in your story for the idea to be conveyed to an audience. And as we get into um, um, some films down the road here, uh, coming right up very soon, you're going to get that sense. Like, you know, zombies are indicated, they're discussed, but they don't seem anything like the monsters I've seen before. I don't think there's one particular reason for that or one particular answer to why that would be the case. It does appear that there is some kind of exhaustion with the zombie as it is presented up until the late 1940s. So this idea of this this you know mindless creature that's had its will taken away by a singular individual 
for some nefarious purpose simply seems to be something that audiences are not as interested in experiencing either in large scale theater settings or in their homes. Um, what comes to stand in for the zombie uh, at this time is fairly interesting and that's a topic we'll be able to discuss more I think after we've watched films like I Bury the Living and Carnival of Souls because they become something quite different going forward and then we'll of course get George Romero's uh, you know cannibal zombies which I'm sure that you are aware of already if you've never heard of Night of the Living Dead then you're about to understand it uh, really really well so we're in a transitional period and last time I kind of indicated that's where we were headed. We were going from a time when the zombie was very well defined, repeated endlessly, formulaically in film. Now we're in a period where the zombie seems very loose and fluid um, and we're trying to find out, you know, what is it about the zombie that makes it scary? Um, besides, you know, as this film tells us, the horror of it taking away your, your personality and will, when we actually run into the zombie, that doesn't seem to be the case. So there's some dissonance here between, you know, what we've been told is scary about the zombie and what we're actually seeing the zombie do. So this concept is kind of degrading, I think, in the popular culture. But don't count the zombie out yet because it's going to come back, uh, as they always do, in a slightly different form. So pay real close attention to the larger film when you're watching Scared Stiff because this is a film that's about a lot of things, one of which is a zombie, but if you watch it and try to ask yourself how is this similar to or different from previous things I've watched this semester, just in terms of the film aspects of it, I think you'll come up with some really interesting observations.